This is uh, Care for the Caregiver, and I would like to introduce to you Ann Osborne. Ann is a psychotherapist, and um, in addition to what she does, she was also very instrumental in offering help with uh, people dealing with devastating loss during the Paradise, California fires. Campfire. So, please give a round of applause for Ann Osborne. Okay, I'm going to do a little plug for this book because all the proceeds for this book uh, go back to this organization. I don't get anything out of it. I wrote it and it will have more in-depth information for care providers or caregivers, whichever you want to use, um, because all I'm going to do is do an overview. Melanie, Melody, um, where's the other the attorney? I'm sure you're coming. I'm okay, good. Thank you. All right, so there's the It's Joanna, right? Thank you. Okay, so you heard my background has been working with law enforcement and fire for the last 30 years. I had a full-time private practice until the diagnosis, as happened to a lot of us. And so, <clears throat> Um, I have a very unique role. Uh, some of you know that my mom passed away from OM back in 1972, actually at UCLA. So I was an adolescent uh, in this area at that time and uh, was diagnosed myself five years ago with class 2 of uh, OM. So I'm going to use my little pieces of paper because I couldn't break away. So allow me to share an overview. One of the biggest issues around being a care provider is the manner in which your perspective is. How you're holding yourself accountable for the role that you're instituting yourself. And we want to be able to have a sense of balance. It comes out around um, your perception and how it's going. I'm anxious, I'm surprised. Uh, your appraisal and how you clarify your own meaning and purpose behind your role of what you're doing. So basically, how does OM affect the care provider? The risk is the premature aging of your immune system. So the idea around taking good care of yourself while you're providing loving support for your loved one is very important. What we've re realized in the research is that care providers tend to downplay symptoms that they may actually be experiencing, whether it's physical, psychological, emotional. So it's very important that you stay in touch with yourself while you're also providing these services for others. So some of the ways that the um, effects can occur is the effect on your mind, how you're tracking, whether you remember things, short-term memory. Um, we write everything down because I just go through the roof when I've forgotten an important appointment or I thought that the appointment was going to be on May 2nd and I got the reservations for our hotel for the night before on the 2nd instead of the 1st. So it's, it's paying attention to the details so that you can take better care of yourself. Concentration is affected. Being able to hone in and take care of whatever the problem is. Some of us have a very difficult time staying on track and producing the work that we need to get done. Or someone like me, I get hyper-focused. I go in for all the details. And I have a difficult time, I'm seeing to the head nodding. I have a difficult time pulling myself back out and seeing the bigger picture. So I've instituted behaviors for myself to just kind of take breaks so that I can walk away. Some of the things I wish I had done years earlier when I was a student, instead of just focusing, 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 because that's exhausting to the brain. This, the things that, the other characteristics, the appetite, the um, concentration, as I said, the memory, appetite can go down or it can go up. And so paying attention to, am I losing weight? So that you're making behavioral choices that will help you make good nutritional choices. Um, paying attention to the quality of your sleep. My husband struggles with um, either he's sleeping a lot because he's still working and he has a very, very stressful job, or he's not able to sleep at all, or it's broken up sleep. 
So staying in touch with what's going on with your sleep patterns helps. We need to be able to take that break so that you can get quality sleep and get the body to rest. Um, the other piece around anxiety, paying attention to, so what I do on my calendar for both my husband and myself is when I've got an appointment, I think the next one is in January uh, for the next scan, the week before and the week after, I schedule out time for both of us for personal time to go for a hike so that the hormones in the body, the cortisol, the epinephrine, the adrenaline, gets metabolized out of our body. It get, gets metabolized more easily when we do exercise. We also want to pay attention to what we're eating, we're eating food that's uh, easier to digest because husband has, has problems now metabolizing certain kinds of meat. He appreciates being able to have a nice restaurant meal, but then it interferes with his ability to sleep at night. So it's like, okay, as much as I want to have that roast, I can't have it. I need to have something that's easier because the stress hormones are interfering with his ability to digest. I looked up a couple of articles yesterday on care providing because I just wanted to be sure I had the most latest and greatest. And there's one hormone, I'm sorry, blood test, that I don't know that it's even available for us, but what alerted me is that it's specific to care providers. So it underscores the importance about getting your blood work done, staying involved with your physician and your dentist, and watching your own inflammatory process in your body. When things are starting to show up specifically for care providers, I'm like, oh, that's not good. A lot of us uh, moving off of the physical, psychological, and emotional, a lot of us start questioning um, our religious faith. Some of us um, belong to church groups. This would be the time to let your minister or your pastor or whoever the person is know that you're going through this because this is difficult. We want to create a pod of people around us to kind of lean on so that we're not shouldering everything on our own. And remember that when we have a challenge ourselves, we're actually educating other people to then be able to carry it on to someone else. So, I mean, in fact, I think, I don't see Charlene. Um, that Charlene and I met through one of her friends in a different group in Chico. Charlene lives in Palo Alto. We happened to meet through the diagnosis. I was like, oh, because her friend said, oh, I have a friend. And so your friend needs to get connected to our group. So, <clears throat> quality of life, money. Money's a big deal. I think Joanne's probably going to be talking about that a little bit. But recognizing that the changes in how the uh, income flow, uh, the stream is changed, it means that if we're raising children, if our children aren't grown, or our grandchildren, or if we're taking care of aging parents, some of the things that we used to do, we can't do because now we're paying for that co-insurance, co <coughs> money's not as available, and so there's disappointments. And as a family, we need to be able to talk about that. The, um, there are different kinds of navigators. When I was first diagnosed, it was such a flurry as it has been for all of us. I learned the term navigators. And so there's different kinds of navigators. You can look them up online. It depends upon where you live. But some, some of them are nurses or they're uh, social workers that have had experiences in working in the oncology field. And they're there. One specific type is working on finances and health insurance. Some of us need help being able to navigate those waters, and that person may be someone that you want to bring in to help you figure out what you're doing with your own finances, because it's very complicated. Your children, basically finding out from your children what parts of treatment bother them, what you're doing when you're asking these questions, is you're opening up the opportunity for conversation. How much do the children want to be involved? How much do other people, other ancillary family members want to be aware that it's okay to talk about this diagnosis? Some people say, nope, I don't want to talk about it. I've got other people that I have to care for. Some people are relieved because, oh, it is permission given to be able to talk. 
So the preventative plan. These are especially important because what we want to do is start envisioning the idea that we need breaks after each traumatic experience. That's the best way I can uh, describe it. Because going to these MRIs, I just kind of brace myself and I get into a certain frame of mind because then I have to go through the experience I don't particularly care about. Um, but I'm also pretty self-involved in my own head as I'm trying to take care of, all right, I don't know what the results were. I wanted to ask how many people get results from the scans the same day? Thank you. How many people have to wait three days? Five days? A week. A week. Longer? <coughs> Those periods of time are extremely stressful. Thank you for answering the question. And it's what, what do we do with our care provider and our loved one to be able to navigate those waters. What helps each other get through that? Is it time going to the movies? Is it walking around the block? Is it a time to cook? Some people, you know, drain off their energy. So being able to look at having restorative benefits in these blocks of time so that you can drain off, once again, that epinephrine <coughs> and cortisol. Maintaining your focus, not prioritizing your loved one over yourself. So I'm going to go through a couple of bullets here. Accepting help. When we are accepting help, we're actually modeling to our family members, teaching them that it's okay and it's healthy to accept help from other people. And I think this may go back to what Doug was talking about, about receiving and giving compliments. We're kind of a very independent culture. Um, there's a whole lot of background to that. I don't have the time to go into why we're such an independent culture, but we want to be able to model that it's good to ask for help. I would also encourage us to state, figure out specifically what kind of help and what it looks like. So when John walks up and says, I'm here to help you, what can I do? You have answers and you can give back. Some of us, it's articulating, you know, I'd really like to have a casserole but I have all these restrictions. No, no, no. Okay, so you, you want to give us food, that would be wonderful. How about someone to transport the kids or take my mom to the local museum that she wants to go to? Those kinds of tasks then help someone be successful in helping you. By doing that, you're giving yourself time to be able to recharge yourself. The idea that you get a time of, of just a break Go see your friends. Go figure out what the next to-do task list is so that you know that you're assuring yourself, I'm not forgetting something, but you're giving yourself a break so that you can recharge yourself. One of the things that my husband started doing two or three years ago was um, I have a specific group every Tuesday night, many, many years, decades, um, for meditation, and so what he does is he, after he gets off of work, he comes home, I and mean, he doesn't come home, he goes out to the local uh, sports bar and watches the game. And he actually moves around to different sports bars just so that he can find different groups that he can, yeah, let me really happy sports are not my thing for that kind of stuff. So it works for him, he gets time away, he works <coughs> himself, and when he's all excited and really happy about that, a good thing to know is that he's bathing his brain with feel-good hormones that are counteracting all the stress. So encourage time away. It took a little bit of adjustment for me, because after getting the diagnosis, all of a sudden I'm like very attached to my husband. But now, uh, like when I'm down here, after his, he's finished his work week, he will take two or three days before I get home, and he goes out and scouts around us. He's actually down in Napa, and Sonoma, looking around for a place for us to stay uh, come Thanksgiving. Part of it is because then he gets to do some of the exploratory stuff, which is really helpful for him. He's also creating new relationships. We need to open the scan so that we're not caught in our little world of trying to survive and thrive. So being able to become more creative, entertaining new hobbies, 
part of it is so that we can also feel that we've got our own life. We're not just taking care of someone else. We're not giving up our lives for the other person. Exercise, can't say enough. I'm a big exerciser. I love exercise. I've always had a mood disorder. I have a, a tendency to get anxious, like I am. And so being able to go out and go for a long walk, uh, go work out, you know, do things that will help get that stuff out of your body because that's what adds to the premature aging immune system. I've gone over leisure time and how important it is to support ourselves in gaining balance. The whole piece here is getting a sense of perspective, evaluating what's going on for how you see yourself doing while you're care providing, but also attending to your own relationship with yourself. Supporting each other, the questions to be able to ask you and your care provider, uh, I'm sorry, loved one, is how are we coping? Are we doing enough to take care of ourselves and each other? What's causing stress for us? What choices can we make together? So my husband only goes to the scans with me because that's the most important, you know, the results is kind of important. I go to all the other appointments. I live three hours away from where I get treatment. So um, I go down on my own, I bring a girlfriend, we do something special for that. Being able to be able to reduce that toxicity of just sitting there and just, you know, bracing himself. Finally, what are we grateful for? My whole push, he doesn't tend to be kind of the, here we are kind of person. He's very quiet and figuring things out. He's an attorney as well. You as well. You just kind of hold it all. Engineer. Engineer. Uh -huh. Oh. Well, this is my dad was an engineer. And this is a perfect environment for that. So being able to open up and share. When we're in that uh, room waiting for the diagnosis, he doesn't talk. I'm a little chattery. But um, I have to give him space to handle his process himself and respect it. And that's the point of what we're all doing on this. Intimacy. So the intimacy issue is, after going through the treatment, even though it doesn't look like I'm any different than I was before treatment, in my own mind, I didn't feel very attractive anymore. I'm vulnerable. The idea that um, <coughs> I want to be intimate with my husband, we needed to talk about, even though it doesn't make sense to someone else that that's how I feel, Remember, any of our feelings are valid, and we don't have to know why things are the way they are. We want to validate it and honor it, and my ability to be able to share it then kind of quiets that down. Also, being able to talk about what doesn't work anymore and how things have changed, and being able to support each other in that, because we want to be able to create memories for each other and creating hope. So the intimacy and self-support, um, what could you use more of? What has helped you? Uh, linking up with someone here. Talk with pe other people here about what your experiences are. Remember that walking, um, meditating, and accepting nutritional changes in your diet that we heard yesterday um, will reduce the sense of fatigue, both mentally and physically and help us feel like we're doing good management of our stress and we're maintaining our balance. So I'm going to suggest that we go ahead and hand it over. Um, I suggest that the tools on Saturday are, is a good um, presentation I'm doing. Of course, it's good, it's mine. But <laughs> the idea that there'll be some uh, stress interventions. Um, these are also two sources that I found online yesterday that may be helpful. Our Wi-Fi in this hotel is not the best, so I did not personally try to go find them. So after she presents, um, if there's any time, I see your question, uh, then we'll come back and do questions and answers. But go, I want to go ahead and take questions. What is the, what is the time? It's 8:25. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yes. Sir. I just wanted to be a commentator. First off, uh, I've been going up 10 years now. My wife had breast cancer. And after the first, she went through uh, three surgical procedures. After the first one, I'm far ready to take her home. And they're giving us post-op directions to get the uh, recovery room. And I 
they always live a proverbial smart And I just, I'm holding hands with her. She's in bed with two nurses in her foot giving us a car. The direction. And I just looked at her and I said, very quietly, I said, honey, I said, just remember one thing. She said, what's that? I said, you can't have a die on me. She looks at me and she says, why not? I said, it's not like a freaking stamp. I've been treated another one. <laughs> well, hmm. the nurse, one of the nurse, the nurses started to laugh. One of them said, are you going to take that? She said, wait until I get your sorry ass home. And one of them had to go for a couple of days or <laughs> over. You know, brevity has always been a part of my lifestyle. As, as a student of Freud, I can take a phrase and throw it back at you and have it, it has an entirely different meaning. So let me give everybody else in the audience an opportunity. So what he was referring to is that his wife had breast cancer 10 years ago and that when they were getting ready to be discharged from the first surgery, he was able to, I, I don't even want to ruin it. Throw brevity on the situation and make, make it a laughing, uh, make people laugh with the severity of the issue. So using a sense of humor and being able to lighten up because it is that is what will get us through in surviving all of this is how do we see the brighter side. Subsequent I am a cancer survivor myself. And my wife and I have been together fifty three years. Fifty three years. That's that's kind of I just learned how to say yes to a long time ago. <laughs> that's what my husband has too. Yeah. All right, well thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the name, I'm glad you asked. I, I, I wrote it down because I have heard of it. It's called Plasma I, the capital letter I, capital L dash six. So again, I don't even know if it's available on blood work at this point. It was an article that was written through um, NIH. It's a stress, it's reflective of stress and how stress is affecting you. It's plasma, capital I, capital L, dash six. I knew this group would want to know. Thank you so much. So maybe um, instead of trying to pull up slides, we'll just have a conversation. So how many of you actually are working? And how many of you feel like it's a challenge balancing work and everything else that's going on? Yeah. So when we talk about caregiving rights, um, we spend a lot of time talking around employment and also how that has a financial impact um, on the family. And so there are some laws that provide protections. The Americans with Disabilities Act is a federal law that provides protection in the employment arena for people with disabilities. And really the bottom line of the ADA is that it doesn't allow employers to make decisions based on someone's medical condition. But there is also a line in the ADA that says people who associate with a person with a disability are protected against discrimination. And that actually provides some protection for caregivers in the workplace as well. So caregivers can't be treated differently at work based on your caregiving status. So that could take a lot of different shapes. So sometimes we hear from caregivers that um, they're being demoted, or they're not being promoted, or they're not getting the assignments that they want, or you know being pushed aside in some other way, or transferred to another location. So it's not really overt things, maybe. Um, sometimes it's less obvious. Uh, but really the bottom line is employers aren't supposed to be taking into consideration the fact that you're a caregiver in the workplace. Uh, and so the ADA provides some protections. And most people are familiar with the ADA because there are ramps into buildings and accessible parking spots, but there's a whole section of the ADA that just focuses on employment. And certainly this is information that's also relevant, relevant to the people who you're caring for if they're working. And so in the other room, I brought some materials on the ADA um, I also brought some information on the FMLA, because the FMLA is the federal law that allows people to take time off work for their own serious medical condition or as a caregiver 
for a spouse, a parent, or a child. And that's a pretty limited definition of who you get to care for. It's not parent and mama, or grandparent, or sibling. It's just spouse, parent, or child. That can be really useful for someone who needs to take that time off. And really, the key thing about the FMLA is it doesn't just give you time off, it protects your job. So it provides that job protection, and it protects your health insurance benefits if you get your health insurance through your employer. And that is also really significant, because you don't want to be pushed out of your job because of caregiving status or your need to take time off work. So the FMLA provides people with up to 12 weeks of leave per year. So every year, you get 12 weeks off as a caregiver, or for your own serious medical condition, or sometimes a combination of the two. So it's very flexible, because that 12 weeks could be taken off as a solid block of time, or it could be taken off in smaller segments of time, even like an afternoon to take someone to a medical appointment. So the FMLA is actually a really useful tool. The downside to the FMLA is it's unpaid leave. So most people can't afford to take 12 weeks off of work without having any income coming in. So that's a really practical problem. Now, how many of you are in California? So California is one of a handful of states that actually provides paid family leave for caregivers. So if you are not familiar with paid family leave, you should write down this address. It's edd.ca.gov, and that's the Employment Development Department's website in California. And they're the state agency that oversees paid family leave. So when you go to their website, you search for paid family leave, and it provides six weeks of paid leave for caregivers. And there's a broader definition of who you get to care for under that program. So if you are taking care of a sibling or an aunt or uncle, you might be able to get paid family leave. So it's not 100% of what your salary would be if you were taking time off, but it's certainly better than the unpaid leave of the FMLA. And so you can take that time together so that the FMLA is providing some job protection and health insurance protection and paid family leave is stepping in. So there, I'm trying to think about some of the other states that were in the room yesterday. Where are the rest of you from, if not from California? Texas. Texas. Tennessee. Texas does not have paid family leave. Tennessee. Tennessee doesn't either. Missouri. There does Missouri. I'm sorry. Um, but I think that those are also good examples of where there's some advocacy opportunities. I think paid family leave is something that everybody is looking at right now because it applies to, to many more people than just the cancer community. Um, certainly as our population ages, uh, caring for family members is going to become more and more important. And so there have been some proposals at the federal level to create paid family leave opportunities or to expand the FMLA. Uh, but nothing has been successful so far. The one other downside to the FMLA is that you actually have to have worked for an employer with 50 or more employees. So if you work for a smaller employer, the FMLA isn't going to apply to you. And you have to have worked there at least 12 months and worked 1,250 hours in the last 12 months that you worked for the employer. So, there's some nuances to all of that, and again, I brought some materials that flesh out that information. And if taking time off work um, is something that you're interested in, we actually have a webinar on our website at triagecancer.org that goes into great detail about the ADA, the FMLA, um, and disability insurance. Um, there are a few other options that are available to caregivers to replace some of the income um, that you might be losing by taking unpaid leave under the FMLA. So, uh, under the state Medicaid program, there are options that the state can provide. They're not required, so every state is a little bit different in terms of how they handle it. Uh, but in California, the program that I'm referring to is called in-home support services. And if the person who you're caring for actually qualifies for Medicaid, even if they're not on Medicaid, they can actually have their family members get paid as caregivers through the state program. So it's kind of a one of those best kept secrets. Because it's an optional program, they kind of come and go based on state budgets. So every year it's kind of a question as to whether or not the program's available um, or how much they're actually paying caregivers. But it might be something that is available to the person who you're caring for. Yeah. Does the uh, family member have to live in the home? Can they live in a separate place that you're responsible for going back and forth? 
they don't have to live in the same home that you're in. Right. But typically, if someone is in a nursing home, no. for example, right. then they wouldn't qualify for exactly. in-home support services because exactly. they're not living in their own home. Because the idea is to help people stay in their own home. Exactly. Thank you. Um, but when we're talking about, that's actually a good question. So if you're caring for someone who's out of state, um, or someone is caring for you out of state, where you live and pay your payroll taxes depends on what programs you have access to. So for example, if you are caring for someone who lives in Texas, but you live in California, you can actually draw on California's paid family leave program because you're paying your payroll taxes in California, so you can draw on that system. But if it was vice versa, where the person in Texas is caring for you in California, they couldn't draw on the paid family leave program because they're in Texas and that's where they pay their payroll taxes and they don't have that program. So there is some flexibility there, but it also doesn't go both ways. So are there other questions about maybe things that have come up or concerns that you have about the workplace or finances? Well, I did have uh, one th uh, question that uh, centered more toward finances and the uh, ACA and um, actually politics as it's evolving in our next election. I know that these, and I don't mean this to be political, but I just mean it to explore the possibilities of the ramifications of the election because you have Democrats going for Medicare for all. You were talking yesterday about that, and it was a very uh, good presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, and crystallized some vaporous thoughts I had about it. But, um, and I know that um, certain Democratic candidates uh, want to continue the Affordable Care Act, which is already under attack in the courts, and the possibilities of that being reinstated and broadened, which would help a lot of people that have, regarding the pre-existing considerations under that. And um, the way things are going under present administrations, which seems to be trying to gut that, uh, particularly attacking pre-existing conditions at this point in time. I know no politician, as we've seen, is held down to what they promise. Uh, but uh, that being the, the case, should any of these uh, promises come to fruition, which would be most likely to keep the pre-existing conditions in the act? Because I know Medicaid, if Medicaid it wouldn't matter as Medicaid is set up at this point in well, time. Medicaid they have to expansion accept expansion might go away entirely. So if ACA is struck down, that expansion might go away. Yes, well, that's the big concern, obviously. And it, and it really keeps uh, a number of myself included tied to an um, antiquated and expensive insurance policy because if we are going to the ACA and having that provision taken away and then you out on the exchanges that aren't friendly to people with pre-existing conditions. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> uh, I know. I mean, it, it, <laughs> No. If you if you would break, would Medicare for all be good for people? So for uh, people in our spouses' <coughs> situations, are so I think there, there's a couple of pieces to this, and sometimes it's about language, right? We are sure. we are bad at using good language to describe health insurance, which is why we have so much confusion. So when we talk about the idea of Medicare for all, that actually takes a lot of different forms. So we kind of use it as a catch-all to des describe something, but it doesn't actually explain what the details of that look like. Nor have any of the candidates, but. <laughs> and some more than others, I mean, they yes. all do have very different approaches, but I think yeah. here's the bottom line, and I'm merely sharing my perspective since you asked it. Which as someone who's done it. this work for 20 years, I personally can't go back to a day where I had to tell people there's nothing for you. There is no health insurance option for you, so you cannot get care. 
that's horrible. Like sure. there, we're in the United States. No one should not. No one should die because they can't get access to health care. And we know the numbers of people who died because they couldn't get access to health care before the ACA. So there are some really very clear practical implications of the ACA being repealed, and I think for everybody. And I think that's what people don't understand. It's interesting for me because I do speak in every state, and there's a lot of different perspectives about how to reform our healthcare system, and that's legitimate. Like, that's part of our political process to have discussions about how we do that. But healthcare has been politicized in a way that has been detrimental to everybody because we can no longer have those practical discussions about the best way to do that. So, that said, I would say that in the United States, Having some version of universal health care where everybody can get access to health care, I think, is fundamental. I personally think access to health care should be a right, not a privilege. Uh, how we do that, it's all about, you know, when we talk about the law, we always say the devil's in the details because how we do that and then how we pay for it are where there's a lot of discussion and differences of opinion. So when we talk about Medicare for all, there are different levels of that. So it could be starting with a Medicare buy-in program, which has been talked about for a long time, where we allow people who are 50 or 55 to 65 to buy into Medicare. So you're paying a premium that's higher than you would if you were 65. So you're basically buying Medicare as health insurance the way you would in the private market, which could be really useful for that age bracket of people because premiums for that age bracket in the open market are so much more expensive. So that could be a step to expand access to coverage. So the Medicare for all in moving the entire country to Medicare and no longer having private insurance is at the other end of that spectrum. And there are always pros and cons to everything. Um, I think what is important to remember going into the election, and this is maybe more pointed to your question, is that candidates can promise everything. They can have pie-in-the-sky ideals, and that can tell you something about their character and what they hope for the country, but it doesn't tell you what they can get through Congress. And those are two entirely different things. So it can be helpful in trying to narrow down your choices related to candidates in terms of their principles and their ideas and what kind of president they would be, it doesn't tell you anything about what they can actually get done when they're in office because that's dependent on Congress. And what is so interesting about the Affordable Care Act for me is most people don't realize that the ACA was like hundreds of different policy proposals that all got pushed into one bill and that's what ended up getting passed through Congress the majority of those policy proposals were actually proposed by Republicans. But the fact that a Democratic president signed the final bill and it was politicized in that way changed the entire conversation around the ACA, even though most of the principles and policies in the law were actually Republican proposals. So it's so hard to talk about health insurance in a basic, practical way because it's been dramatized and politicized in a way that makes it hard just to talk about. People get very emotional about it as opposed to just looking at what's in the law. Well, I, I agree with, because I think the object at, the, at that time when they went in with the ACA was to get universal health care. People didn't want to give up private providers. It was and, an amalgamation and of lots of different ways to try to expand was coverage for different came out of, yeah. yeah. But what's important to remember is all legislation is a compromise. Yeah, absolutely. I cannot point even the laws that I think have been incredibly helpful to the cancer community, there's not a single one I can think of that's perfect. The ADA is not perfect. The FMLA is definitely not perfect. It carves out huge groups of people who can't use it, and it's unpaid. So it's actually not, more than half the people who are eligible for the FMLA don't take it because they can't afford to. That's only a halfway useful law. So I think where where we do a disservice, um, and I say we in terms of the advocacy community, as lawyers, as people who are involved in policy and advocacy, is where we politicize
politicize some of these conversations. It is totally fine and legitimate to disagree over how to do some of these things, but that can be done without um, it being so antagonistic and causing confusion for people. So that's my very long-winded answer to your question. I see the subject as litigious. It's an antagonistic subject matter, but it's become very litigious in the states. What do you mean? What has been litigious? Well, taking taking for taking a look at what is the happening to the ACA. And the whole thing has become litigious. You know, yeah, taking, I mean, taking away female care, taking away one aspect, one surgical procedure, because you've got a bunch of religious fanatics that don't like it. Yeah, I mean, honestly, that's, that's, that actually, while well, frustrating <laughs> for some of us, <coughs> is how the system is supposed to work. Right? So a law gets passed, and if people feel like that law is unconstitutional, filing a lawsuit and arguing whether or not that law meets our standards, our constitutional standards, which I feel like these days get ignored quite a bit. Um, and as a lawyer, that's scary. Uh, that's how the process is supposed to work. And so ultimately, the courts decide whether or not the law is constitutional or not, whether it be the state constitution or the federal. Um, where that's become more challenging is the independence of the judiciary. Um, I'm trying to find the right word. Uh, has changed over time. In other words, the deck is stacked. Yeah, so I'm recorded right now, so I have to be no, no. incredibly careful about how to phrase this. It's but I would say, you know, we're all in the same boat here. But I, but I do. I'm very respectful of the idea that of differences of political opinion, and I think that it, our system works because there are differences of opinion, and I completely respect that. I think where it's become um, worrisome for me. Um, not only in doing the work that I do in the cancer community, but also as a lawyer, is that our institutions and the processes set up by our Constitution are failing us right now. The system isn't working the way that it's supposed to. I, I have a phrase that I kind of like several years ago about that. Every able has a schmuck for an attorney. Um, <laughs> the difference of opinion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, any I've other got, questions? I've got attorneys in my family. Yeah, so, um, I think that the interesting thing about the law is that there are always two sides. You can always make an argument for both sides. Um, the question is how a jury or a judge is going to agree with either side. and and. When I say that the judiciary is lacking some independence, that they're not always um, solely focused on the way that a law is complying with or not complying with the Constitution. They're, they're along their religious preferences to uh, guide their interpretation of the law to whatever they feel? Um, I think that that's possible. I think that there are lots of things that impact their decisions. So are there any other questions about, I'm happy to answer insurance questions from yesterday too, if there are insurance or finance or employment issues or any other issues related to care giving? What's the best way to stay on top of the, the pending decision about ACA? Um, I would definitely say our blog is an easy place to go because 
will be sharing that information as stuff comes out. And the blog is just triagecancer.org forward slash blog. Uh, but we also, um, I would say if you're really interested in health policy and following it, um, a source that I love to stay on top of what's happening with at the state and federal level um, is Politico Pulse. Um, it's a free newsletter that arrives every day in your inbox. Um, I was just scanning it earlier to see what's happened today. Uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation is also a good um, source of, excuse me, <coughs> of information related to healthcare. Um, Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Of course. So what is really affecting, what do you folks find is affecting you? What's, what's been interesting in the time that you've been here beyond walking on glass? Yeah. I congratulate all of us at that opportunity. What's affected you or is affecting you outside of this conference that in your role as a care provider? Because this will help me understand what I want to convey to whoever the speaker is for care providers, but it's not normally me. Um, Yes. A, a veteran for me, as a cancer survivor myself, and my wife being a cancer, a cancer survivor, the community of the person, this young lady that I'm sitting next to, everybody here, we're all focusing on one thing as a caregiver, making sure our dependents. Recipient of our care is okay and feeling well, and the fact that we all have a common focus and we're able to share it without technically any breach of HIPAA. So, I think what if I were to summarize what you're stating is basically being able to have a sense of community. Yes. whether it's online or here at the conference, yes. rec begin, beginning to start putting names and faces together and having a sense that, yes, it's important for your loved one who's a recipient of your care be all right, but also recognizing that we're in it together. Would that be fair? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. The feeling of community. The feeling of community. And that we're not isolated and alone. It, my happen chance to break into this community five years ago was a happen chance comment I said to the radiation oncologist. You know, if you know, because the whole HIPAA thing is, you know, it has its benefits, but it also has some real challenges. As a medic, I know that. Yes. So the idea that it was a happen chance, if you know anybody that would be willing to talk to me, that's how I got the link in, and it was Jack. So mm -hmm. that worked well for me. How about other people? I know it's early in the morning. We're all getting started. It's a full day ahead and a very full weekend. Others? Yes? Um, my question is, um, my daughter is diagnosed. Yes. yes. Um, and, you know, she's on the younger side, early 60s. And um, she, she just said, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Or, you know, She has a husband, but he's gone a lot. Um, and of course, with melanoma, you can look great, you know, act normal, and you can't tell from the outside that something's going on. And, you know, I don't know if, um, if I should push on issues or just let her decide. It's a delicate dance. So she has a daughter who's in her early 60s and mom is wanting to help more, but um, daughter is married, but her husband travels a great deal, and she's concerned about whether or not her role as a care provider, as mom, she should be pushier. The only thing that I would suggest is, um, if you're very concerned, this is having an effect on you, asking her to articulate, how, how else can I help, and expressing your concerns, and respecting, I daughter, 
I, I love you too, and I want to know if, if there's anything I can do at all, even just spending time together, going out for your cup of coffee or whatever it may be. I don't even know if you live near her. Yeah, close, close by, okay. So it, it, it is about respecting her role, and I don't know how much she really wants to talk about what's going on for her. She, she does talk about it. I'm uh, feeling more confident just being here with her, sharing this experience. So back to the community. That uh, maybe she'll let me in. I see the emotion. Yeah. It's a very difficult role that you're on the outside. But going back to those four questions, I, I don't know if the handouts got developed for us, but those four questions about what's going well, how could we do something better, what else do we want to explore, or what, what do we want to let go of? Yes? I just wanted to share two resources that might be helpful. So um, if you need psychosocial support, if you just want to talk to somebody, um, Cancer Care has a hotline. Um, to speak to social workers, specifically for caregivers. Um, Very good. So I would recommend taking a look at their website. They have a lot of resources for caregivers, actually. Uh, and their website is just cancercare.org, I think. Um, and then there's also a platform called LOTSA Helping Hands. And LOTSA is spelled L-O-T-S-A, Helping Hands. And it's actually a platform that caregivers can use to ask for help with driving to appointments or meals or anything else that you need help with, like picking up groceries. Um, and so it's a nice platform to be able to share with other people um, to help balance out all of those daily activities. So that was lots of helping hands. So my assumption would be that uh, that's a bigger community. Yes. So if you're living in a smaller community, that may not. But it's definitely worth checking out. So lots of helping hands and Cancer Cares has a, is it CARE or CARES? CARE. CARE. That they have a hotline to be able to talk when you're feeling shut out or you're very concerned about getting a better understanding of what the other person may be going through. That's very helpful. Thank you so much. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes? She has the desire to help you. So you're the care provider, she's the patient. Um, that's going to be a delicate talk between the two of you about how open you want to be. Um, some families do not talk about it. It's, it's forbidden to talk about, and we need to be able to respect that. Your kids may end up having more information than her kids, and there could be resentment that builds up. It, if you have an okay, then it, it, I was, as a family therapist, I would suggest sitting down, everybody sits down together if that's possible, if it's not a geographic issue, and openly talking about what their concerns are, what is going well, and what the picture may look like. How old are the children? This is 11, 14, 15, and 20. 19, instead of 21. Oh, okay. So you've got a wide range. So the 11 year old thinks differently than the 21 year old. And so it's going to come down to how the message is delivered. The 11 year old, the things to know about children is they will keep everything inside themselves and, and not let on until they know that mom and dad are okay. So their survival depends on mom and dad being okay. Yes, their viewpoint, yes. And so, um, Behavioral issues can show up a year later, in part because they don't understand what's going on, they're very scared, and, it, and so they act it out. That's what acting out is, is that we're acting out the, the emotional issues that we don't know how to articulate. It might be a consideration to, if you know of someone who's a family therapist, if they could orchestrate a sit-down conversation and make it relaxed. Um, you all can do it yourselves. As family therapists, we used to encourage once a week meeting and have a fun activity afterwards. 
so that um, people can enjoy the process of what you're going through. But they, I know for myself, what has helped me personally, and I write it every time on the when I um, on the patient group, is that it really helps me reading about longevity. It really helps me to see people who are writing down that, oh, I'm celebrating someone last night who's celebrating 21 years. Great, I'm very glad that you're writing that down because it helps the rest of us. I'm at five years, almost five years. And, and you know the walk. We're walking step by step by step. Does that help? Yes. All right. And yes. I guess what I've been struggling with is this sort of invisible threat that comes along with this diagnosis. And it's very unrelatable when I'm talking to a lot of people because they'll say, how's your mom? And is she doing better? And it's like, yeah, but. How's your eye? It's all, yeah, it's like the eye, we're so far gone beyond that point right now. Um, but it's just this invisible threat that there's class two designation that just follows you. And, and you know, I live across the country from my mom. Do I, do I move back? And do I just spend every waking moment I have with her? You know, it's just, I guess I don't know. It's been hard to focus on my own life with this hanging in the air um, and not knowing how, you know, how to carry on, I guess, daily life. It, and it's not, it's not real yet. Or, you know, you're not on the high alert, but you are. And I, I don't know. It's just very nebulous. Yeah. So I think uh, what you were saying as a daughter and care provider living in cross country, I just want to be sure that everybody hears this. It's very difficult for you to, to be able to carry on with your own life, which she really wants you to do. And just as a family therapist, it's really important that you continue on with your own life. And she will probably feel much better when she sees that you are doing your stepping stones in your life, your career, education, partnership with whomever, and that you're developing your life. That will help her let go and perhaps open up a little more that she sees that it's not too much of a burden for you. I can see that it's really affecting you. The idea that you being able to articulate how much this is, is important to you. One of the things that has helped me, first of all, some people are not going to get it. I also clearly state, I mean, some of the people that don't get it in my personal life are psychologists that have always been able to tune in to me. But they're off in their own little world. And I just have to let go and back up and just say, okay, I'm, I think you were saying, the woman behind you, I have to pick my battles. And so it's, it's going to come back to the communication issue. Perhaps you also being able to sit down and talk with someone about how difficult this is for you. Because she's very important to you. Clarifying, mom, I really need to know when can I, when do you want me to step in, if you want me to step in at all? Because I don't know, I don't know that she would be very comfortable with the idea of you moving back. It's, it's, it's very challenging. I hope that you'll come to the, uh, I think it's Saturday at 11, I'm doing tools and interventions on how to be able to carry this sense of lurking. I wish you the best of it. It's helpful, it's helpful the answer of the care providers. I think that there's a new support group on families. I don't remember the name of the gentleman that started it. Um, <coughs> Mike, um, Martha, hang on. I, I wish you luck on getting online to be in the support groups for care providers because this is a burden. It's toxic stuff. Ocular Melanoma Community, a group of people, right? Use a group for family, friends, and supporters. That is the full name of the group. Excellent. By Mike Rogelard. Thank you. The blessing about, I think that we all have is there's so many people who want to help us amongst ourselves. And I'm grateful for that. Anything else? Yes. And the same direction that I did the state that came in completely um, for people with like insensitive comments and like that just don't get it. You know, that are practical jokes that you may not 
not be appropriate in front of a person who just lost their eye. Who just lost their eye. Their eye. Okay, so she, if I understand correctly, the question is, how do, how do I uh, respond to someone who's cracking jokes in front of the person who just had an a new new well, you make light of the situation, but some of them are a little inappropriate, so it's hard to be proud of the other person's So you're wanting to protect, and you're being affected because you don't know how to be able to set a limit on someone who's being inappropriate. I saw my own hackles just come right up because um, this is a boundary issue and either pulling that person aside and saying it's really not okay, this is a subject that's very difficult and there's a, lo a long process of adjusting to a nucleation. I did not have a nucleation, but I did mention my body perception changes, my intimacy <coughs> issues change, it just floats down so many aspects of our lives. and. Those inappropriate comments are more about that person and their inability to deal with the difficult stuff, and they need to stop it. And so if you could do it privately, is that something that you're able to do? Then pull someone else that can help. You know, there's a lot of people like myself and other adults who are not emotionally involved in the situation. I, I gather it's kind of a sibling thing. I know what those things are. Good luck. Don't try to do it by yourself. Have someone else help you with it. Because, again, on these family dynamics, we never know what the waters are that we're treading. All right, yes. Walk softly and carry your kids. Exactly. Walk softly and carry your kids. More big words. And know that you have all of us behind you. You have the whole community behind you. Practice it online. Don't try to do this all on your own. This is difficult. Right. Anything else? Uh, the suggestion might be. I think he's trying to reach out to you. Yeah, a su suggestion might be the technique that I use when I tell this issues. Is I give the person just take a sheet of paper and write what kind of quick response you can give to protect the person you're taking care of. And get your message across with a few words, not a sermon. You know, so writing six down or the ten comments. words, write down a couple comments in your own words that you feel are uh, significant, dynamic enough to get right to the gut of a person. You can, something that will just right off the bat and shame them for what they've said without being offensive. So the, I, I, I appreciate what you said about writing it down. I'm not sure about the shaming issue, but the piece about having it written down and holding on to the piece of paper, that's what helps me get through very difficult situations. I think that's why I can't quite give a presentation without holding on to the piece of paper. So, we're available. All right. Thank you so much for all the work that you do do in taking care of all of the loved ones. And I'm available until Sunday. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.